Good morning, all. Good morning. Good morning. Are we good morning? Good morning all. I'd like to call the meeting of the Ventura County Planning Commission uh, hearing to order for September 1st, 2022. Secretary Luce, would you call the roll, please? Thank you. Um, Commissioner Aydoukas? Here. Commissioner King? Here. Commissioner Garcia? Here. Vice Chair Boydston? Here. Chair McPhail? Here. And I'd also like to acknowledge that we have a Spanish interpreter with us today. Thank you. Welcome. Would you all please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance? Ready? Begin. I My pledge allegiance to the flag. To, to the, the United, United States, States, of America, United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Consent item, resolution authorizing continued remote teleconference meetings of the Planning Commission. I would entertain a motion to approve the consent item. Move approval of the consent item. Is there a second? Second. It's seconded by Commissioner Boyston. Secretary Luce, would you call the roll, please? Commissioner Aydoukas? Aye. Commissioner King? Aye. Commissioner Garcia? Aye. Vice Chair Boydston? Aye. Chair McPhail? Aye. Aye. Item number five, public comments. Time set aside for comments by citizens on matters not appearing on the agenda. Do we have any? Chair McPhail, we did not receive any public comments for item number five. Thank okay, you. thank you. And item number four, consent item passed, by the way. <laughs> Approval of minutes for August 18th, 2022. Do I have a motion? Move to approve. Moved by Commissioner Boyston. Is there a second? Seconded by Commissioner okay. Dukas. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Commissioner Dukas. I'll second. Okay. It's been moved and seconded. Secretary Luce, would you call the roll, please? Commissioner Aydoukas? Aye. Commissioner King? Aye. Commissioner Garcia? Aye. Vice Chair Boydston? Aye. Chair McPhail? Aye. Motion carries, 5-0. Item number seven, case number PL21-0043, Applicant County of Ventura, project description, public hearing to consider and make recommendations to the Board of Supervisors regarding county initiated text amendments to articles two, five, six, seven, and 19 of the Ventura County Non-Coastal Zoning Ordinance to revise the apiculture beekeeping regulations, revise regulations pertaining to fences and retaining walls and exempt heating and cooling equipment and similar structures. Project location, non-coastal zone. Case planner, Franca, Rosen, Franca Rosengren. Ms. Rosengren, you have the floor.
Good morning, Chair McPhail and members of the Planning Commission. My name is Franca Rosengren. I'm the case planner for the project before you today, which is a county-initiated text amendment to the non-coastal zoning ordinance related to beekeeping, fence, and equipment. I'm joined today by Winston Wright, Planning Manager, Susan Curtis, Assistant Planning Director, and staff of the Agricultural Commissioner's Office, Corinne Bell, Chief Deputy Agricultural Commissioner, Greta Varian, Deputy Agricultural Commissioner, and Alec Thill, Environmental Resource Analyst 3, and staff from the Resource Management Agency Code Compliance Division, Doug Leeper, Code Compliance Director, and Dean Fanouf, Code Compliance Division Supervisor. The Agricultural Commissioner's Office and the Code Compliance Division worked extensively with planning staff on drafting the beekeeping ordinance. I'd like to bring your attention to an errata memorandum which has been made part of the record as a Exhibit 11. I'd like to make sure that all commissioners has received um, this exhibit. Okay, looks like everyone's received it. I'll start the presentation with a list of proposed text amendments, clarify the decision-making authority process, provide the background and discussion points of each amendment, provide the findings and environmental review, the public noticing procedures and public comments, and then lastly, the recommended actions. The proposed amendments are divided into two parts, board directed and planning director proposed amendments. The board directed amendments involve revising the non-coastal zoning ordinance to allow beekeeping in urban and rural residential zones in the unincorporated areas of the county. And the planning director proposed amendments involve revising the fence and wall regulations and exempting heating and cooling equipment and similar structures from planning division permits. These amendments would apply to areas in the non-coastal zones. The proposed beekeeping ordinance would only apply to properties that are in the following zones, open space, agricultural exclusive, rural agriculture, timberland preserve, single family residential, residential plan development, residential, rural exclusive, and single family estate. Your commission is required to review, conduct a hearing on, consider, and make recommendations to the board regarding the proposed amendments. The board at a subsequent hearing, which is scheduled tentatively for November 1st, 2022, will consider your commission's recommendations and decide whether to adopt, not adopt, or adopt the proposed amendments with modifications. Now we'll start with the proposed beekeeping ordinance. In 2019, the board directed planning staff to expand the allowance of beekeeping in residential zones and to work with the Agricultural Commissioner's Office on drafting regulations and best management practices. Currently, there are minimal standards related to beekeeping in the non-coastal non zoning ordinance uh, beekeeping is referred to as apiculture and is categorized under agriculture and agricultural operations, animal husbandry. It is allowed in the open space, a agricultural exclusive, rural agriculture, and timberland preserve with the issuance of a zoning clearance. This map shows the zones that currently allow beekeeping. Most of the unincorporated areas of the county that allow beekeeping is in the open space area at 80%, shown as olive green, and agriculture at 13%, shown as fluorescent green, or kind of fluorescent green. I've provided a screenshot of the current beekeeping regulations the regulations ensure a safe setback from urban areas as determined by the Agricultural Commissioner, as well as 
minimum setbacks from off-site dwellings, property lines, and to public roads and streets. Additionally, the beekeeper must ensure there is adequate water supplies for the hives. In addition to the current beekeeping regulations, the Agricultural Commissioner's Office runs an apiary program. This program is responsible for registering and documenting the location of hives in the county, including in all 10 cities of the county. By registering the beehives, pesticide applicators are provided the contact information of beekeepers within one mile of the proposed pesticide application to alert them of any proposed application so that the beekeeper can either move the hives or cover them during an application. The apiary program is also responsible for investigating public nuisance complaints created by beekeeping. The Agriculture Commissioner's Office provided staff with some beekeeping data over a three-year period from 2019 to 2021. Uh, in 2021, there were 115 registered beekeepers. That is a 228% increase from 2019. There were 12 complaints received in 2021 that consisted of feral and Africanized bees, lack of adequate water for the bees, hives too close to dwellings, and all of these complaints were satisfactorily resolved. While working closely with the Ag Commissioner's Office, um, they expressed some initial concerns about backyard beekeeping. One of the main concerns was about hobbyist beekeepers and their ability to maintain a healthy bee colony. If not properly educated or trained, the hobbyists may inadvertently introduce pests and pathogens to commercial beekeeping operations and have feral bees that capture domestic bees. Another concern is that by allowing more beekeeping, these new honeybees would compete with native bee communities. Additionally, the novice beekeeper may not provide adequate water or place the hives in a location that is too close to sensitive sites or inappropriate areas on the property. And uh, the potential exposure of foraging bees to pesticide applications. Although the Agricultural Commissioner's Office expressed their concerns, they also understand the potential benefits of backyard beekeeping. Honeybees play a critical role in our agriculture and food system by pollinating all types of uh, food producing plants and flowers. They provide many products used by humans, such as honey and wax. They support the economy, food security, and environmental health, and they promote a healthy community. Statistics show that approximately 75% of bees pollinate our crops and flowering plants, and a single bee colony, colony can actually pollinate up to 300 million flowers each day. After having several discussions with the Agricultural Commissioner's Office, planning staff presented a conceptual draft ordinance to the Agricultural Policy Advisory Committee, the APAC, at a public hearing in the summer of 2019. Planning Division staff and the Agricultural Commissioner's Office recommended uh, at this hearing that first-time registrants would I'm sorry, a technical difficulty. Um, that first-time registrants would need to complete an online education course on beekeeping, um, that they would need to register their hives with the Ag Commissioner's Office annually, which is already a state requirement, um, limiting the number of hives on a property based on the size and the zoning designation, um, provides suitable um, setbacks from property lines, public rights of way and sensitive land uses, and require best management practices. At this um, hearing, test we heard testimony from the public um, one of the requests was to exempt all beekeeping activities from a planning division permit. Staff considered all testimony from the APAC and the Ag Commissioner's Office and from the public, and we revised the ordinance to reflect the changes to include exempting beekeeping activities from a planning division permit. 
In June 2022, the Planning Division presented a second draft ordinance to the APAC, and this meeting was also noticed to stakeholders and interested parties. The APAC had additional recommendations. Uh, they recommended that um, the ordinance restrict the type of bees allowed to only allow honeybees. Um, the planning staff revised the ordinance to reflect this change. Um, APAC also requested that we uh, re consult with county council about adding a liability clause to address a potential liability between a hobbyist beekeeper and a pesticide applicator. Um, we planning staff um, did not add that to the ordinance um, because we were advised that this is outside of the county's legal authority. And APAC also uh, recommended that we reference the right to farm ordinance in the new beekeeping ordinance. Planning staff also did not add that to the ordinance because this right to farm ordinance is already referenced in the non-coastal zoning ordinance. And planning staff determined that it was not necessary to reiterate the language. The Ad Commissioner's Office supports the proposed final draft presented to your commission today. So the intent of the proposed beekeeping ordinance is to continue to allow beekeeping in the four current zones with the same safeguards, to expand beekeeping in certain urban and rural residential zones known as backyard beekeeping with new safeguards, and add development standards and safeguards to address beekeeping in higher density areas. The first set of amendments are in Article 2, that's the definition section, and include adding several new definitions and revising some existing ones related to beekeeping. The current ordinance does not differentiate between beekeeping as a hobby and commercial agricultural beekeeping. As part of this ordinance, staff added two new defined terms, commercial beekeeping and backyard beekeeping. Commercial beekeeping is defined as an operation that is maintained for commercial gain or consists of the keeping or maintenance of five or more hives and or beekeeping accessory to an agricultural operation as verified by the Ag Commissioner's Office. Backyard beekeeping is defined as the keeping or maintenance of an apiary as an accessory use to a single family dwelling for personal consumption of bee products or enjoyment. In Article 5 of the Use Matrix, under Agriculture and Agricultural Operations, the category apiculture has been revised to add commercial beekeeping, shown in legislative format, and the new section number to the development standards for this type of beekeeping. Commercial beekeeping is, will continue to be allowed in the zones that currently allow beekeeping and the permit type would change from a zoning clearance to exempt from planning division permits. In Article 5 of the Use Matrix, under Dwellings Accessory Uses to, a new category has been added to include apiculture, backyard beekeeping, and a cross-reference to the development standards for this type of beekeeping. Backyard beekeeping is allowed in all of the zones that currently allow beekeeping, plus the RE, RO, R1, and RPD zones. Backyard beekeeping is proposed to be exempt from planning division permits. In Article 19 in the Use Matrix, that's the Sadakoi Area Plan. Under Accessory Uses and Structures, a new category has been added under apiculture, backyard beekeeping, with a cross-reference to the development standards for this type of beekeeping. It's allowed in the RES zone um, for single-family dwellings, and it's um, the permit type is exempt. The proposed ordinance consists of three parts. Uh, part one are standards that apply to all beekeeping activities. Part two would apply to only commercial beekeeping. And part three would apply to backyard beekeeping. Part one 
applies to all beekeeping, excuse me, all beekeeping activities, and um, all beekeepers would be required to register annually with the Ag Commissioner's Office. Um, exempt, exempt beekeeping activities would include keeping of bees for education, education or in a physician's office or laboratory. And also, um, in some occasions, um, one additional hive may be brought on the property for swarm control for a maximum of 30 days. Prohibited beekeeping activities. Um, beekeeping will be continued to not be allowed in commercial or industrial zones and also not allowed in higher density zones such as multifamily housing, residential high density, or residential mixed use zones. Um, they also will not be allowed, um, the activity won't be allowed in the RES zone where there are two family or multifamily dwellings. I'm sorry, no Africanized bees and no hives on a roof unless the rooftop deck is a permitted um, deck for walking on. Um, we'll also have nuisance abatement and enforcement procedures for both, um, be, for both commercial and backyard beekeeping. The Ag Commissioner's Office and the Resource Management Code Compliance Division have worked closely on developing this procedure. The Ag Commissioner's Office will take the lead on responding to all commercial beekeeping complaints and complaints related to backyard beekeeping when it involves lack of water, lack of um, adhering to the best management practices, any pest diseases, and hive abandonment. And the RMA Code Compliance Division will respond to complaints related to only backyard beekeeping when they involve setbacks, the number of hives, and the location of hives. Part two, for commercial beekeeping, all standards of part one would apply and the setback requirements that we currently have in place in the ordinance will remain the same. The 400 feet of the apiary shall be 400 feet from any offsite dwelling, 50 feet from any property line, and 150 feet from any public road, street, or highway. The zoning where they allow commercial beekeeping will also not change. It's allowed in the OS, AE, RA, and TP zones and they'll continue to have to provide available and suitable water supplies near the hives. And part three is backyard beekeeping. All standards of part one apply. Um, backyard beekeeping is only allowed, actually I'm sorry, backyard beekeeping is allowed in all of the same zones that we currently allow it, plus in the RE, R1, RES, RO, and RPD zones. Um, this map, um, shows a combined, all the combined zones that allow beekeeping. Properties must be at least 10,000 square feet. And by allowing um, properties that are 10,000 square feet in those zones, over 12,000 more parcels would qualify for beekeeping. Okay. Uh, because backyard beekeeping would be allowed in urban and rural residential zones with smaller lots closer to off-site dwellings and the potential for more interaction with people and animals, the proposed development standards are more robust than the commercial beekeeping standards. The proposed development standards would assist in minimizing negative encounters between bees and humans in the residential zones. A proposed development standards table shows the maximum number of um, hives per legal lot and a minimum lot size. This table also shows the minimum setback requirements for the placement of hives on a property in relationship to the front, side, and rear property lines, as well as when a property line is adjacent to a street. It also provides the setbacks from public rights of way, including equestrian trails and bicycle pedestrian pathways, and the setbacks from a sensitive site. A sensitive site is a new defined term and means any hospital, medical facility, daycare, and both public and private schools. 
These development standards would not affect the number of hives allowed for commercial beekeeping and is solely for the backyard beekeeping um, activities. Another safeguard is the requirement to install a flyaway barrier based on best practices of other cities with similar ordinances that have been in place for several years and in consultation with the Ag Commissioner's Office. Planning staff recommends a flyaway barrier that is a solid fence or vegetation that is at least six feet in height and partially surrounds the beehive. An example of a flyaway barrier is shown on the upper left side of the screen. The flyaway barrier directs the flight of the bees up and overhead and away from neighboring properties. In lieu of the flyaway barrier, the hives must be placed at least eight feet above ground level, for example, on a deck or a balcony. These photos show three examples of acceptable flyaway barriers with the orange check mark. The proposed ordinance prohibits keeping beehives on rooftops as shown on the upper right side of the screen. Here's an example of an R1 zone property that is 10,000 square feet in size. Based on the proposed development standards table, this lot could have a maximum of two hives. Hives shall be set back at least 10 feet from the side and rear property lines. A flyaway barrier shall be installed in front of the entrance to the hives and the beehive entrance is facing away from the nearest property line. Beehives are not allowed in the front setbacks and shall be at least 20 feet from any public right of way. And a water source shall be provided at all times and in close proximity to the beehives. Based on recommendations from the Ag Commissioner's Office, best management practices are proposed for the backyard beekeeping activities. Some of these practices include providing adequate forage habitat, a supply of fresh water, requeening um, protocols, beekeepers shall inspect hives once a month, um, identification requirements, which is already a state requirement, having a shovel and a water hose nearby, and a bee smoker. So with the implementation of the proposed development standards, the minimum setbacks, limits on the number of hives, and the BMPs, staff recommends that your planning commission recommend approval of the proposed beekeeping ordinance. The next proposed amendments e are... Excuse me, before we go to the next <clears throat> fencing and retaining wall amendments, do any commissioners have any, because I want to sp sp split these up. It'll end up being one motion, I suppose, at the end, but I want to split these up. Does any commissioner have any questions of staff? Commissioner King. Yeah, I agree. I, I would like to see uh, what you described is the first part of the agenda. I'd like to see that broken out so we can uh, ask questions and have discussion of that piece separate from the fencing and the um, air conditioning and, you know, a pertinent equipment setbacks. Um, if there are any other commissioners that want to weigh in on that. Go ahead. You had questions? I do, but I want to make sure it's okay with the other commissioners. Any other commissioners have a problem with that? No, because I can't see them, so. Okay, Commissioner no. King, go I, ahead. Oh, I heard somebody. Oh, okay. Um, my first question, and I did pose this um, to Franca prior to the meeting, is um, I'm thinking about a neighbor who has more one or more people living in a house that's a direct neighbor that have known and established serious bee venom allergies. Now, the ordinance takes into account schools and uh, senior facilities and child care, daycare, things where you're going to have a 
a density of folks that may or may not have an allergy. But if there's a known allergy in a residence right next door, can that even be considered a sensitive use since we have a known allergic uh, patient? Thanks, Commissioner King. Um, yeah, so we, we did take that into consideration when we were drafting the ordinance. And um, based on the best practices of other cities and counties, um, we determined that the setbacks that are in place on these residential um, properties is adequate to um, protect, or I say, um, not have conflict with people and animals that are nearby because of the barriers and the BMPs that will um, be in place. So we determined that it would, that a neighbor who potentially has an allergy would um, not be something that we would add into the ordinance, although a friendly neighbor can work with their, it would be like a civil, a civil issue where they can work with their neighbor on that. But no, we didn't add that to the ordinance. Okay, so there's no vehicle for that neighbor with concerns to bring those concerns to the Ag Commissioner, as an example. Commissioner King, yeah, there's no mechanism in place right now for that process. Okay, well, that's what I gathered from your response. Um, the next question, just understand that some of us are lay people that don't know much about ag or beekeeping, so some of these may seem like dumb questions, but uh, dumb people need to ask them, and I'm one of those. Um, what constitutes supplemental nourishment for a bee? Do they, like, pile a bunch of clover buds around, or what is that supplemental nourishment? Commissioner King, I'd like to defer that to our experts who are from the Ag Commissioner's office, and I'd have Greta Varian uh, respond to that, if she's available. I see her. Yes, hello. Yep. Hi, Commissioner King. Um, so I'll speak a little bit to that. So at a minimum, um, the forage is supplemented with uh, basically sugar water. And so that's kind of a, a, at all times if there's not enough forage. Depending on the time of year and the health of the hive, there are also um, liquid or powder supplements or substitutes that the beekeepers can buy is usually online or at a local feed store. And again, that depends on the time of year. Um, sometimes if you add the supplements, the hive gets too big um, to overwinter. So it's not a good thing to do in the fall. Um, and then there's also, depending on the time of year, protein patties that are put out. Um, so the supplements are powder. It's basically like a multivitamin for the bees and it's added to the sugar water. And then the protein patties are um, either real pollen or a, a fake pollen, and then the bees can go collect off of the, the protein patties. And again, that all depends on the season and the time of year. Um, and with the drought, we are seeing beekeepers supplement their bees much more. Okay, thank you. That clears it up for yep, me. You're welcome. Um, uh, the next two questions kind of go hand in hand. Up until now, there's been Nothing in the ordinance that allows, um, for lack of a better term, um, hobby beekeeping in residential zones. Do we have any idea if those activities are actually taking place where they're currently not zoned to be allowed? And if so, how extensive do we believe that is? Commissioner King, my name is Winston Wright. I'm a planning manager for the planning division. Um, we, <coughs> excuse me, there is uh, a lot of interest in um, doing service to saving the bees in the population and in the, in the constituents. Um, there was a citizen group that brought this forward to uh, Supervisor uh, Bennett at the time. And there was a group of hobbyists in the Ojai area that were very active and realized that if their activities in, uh, at their homes was considered a violation of our ordinance, they approached um, Supervisor Bennett and that's how this moved forward. It was, was a, a, an advocacy, advocacy group for um, hobbyists who are very educated and motivated. Okay, so 
It's going on. We know it's going on, and that's how this arose, but it's we don't really on. know how extensive it is. That's correct. And um, in the past 13 years that I've worked here, we've only had to issue one zoning clearance, so making an exemption for the agricultural community like the other uses that are allowed, agricultural activities that are allowed in the AE and OS and timber zones, um, timberland zones, excuse me. But those activities, we haven't been getting zoning clearances requests except for one limited instance of a violation case where there was a concern of a swarm from a commercial beehive. And that was resolved amicably, and, um, but yes, we, it's not a common request to get the permit, but we do know it's occurring. We just don't know the extent. Okay, and, and the tangent to that is, you know, we know we have feral honeybee colonies all over the county. Come April, we hear about them, sometimes on the news. Do we have any idea how extensive these feral uh, honeybee colonies are in the county? I will have to defer that to the Agricultural um, Commissioner's Office. Uh, maybe Greta? Yeah, hi. Yep, yep. Hi, it's Greta again. Um, so I have staff that, it dep again, depending on the time of year, we go out and survey for the feral colonies, and then we also get complaints. I don't, it's not extensive. Um, if we come across some during... You know, we're out at all the nurseries and our pesticide, we're out at all the farms. And if we find feral um, or, or bees are swarming and we get the complaints, but it's not a lot that we find those. Okay. Thank you. And yep. um, my last question has to do with hives in residential zones. You know, you can only put it where there's a single family dwelling. What happens when the single family dwelling puts in a, uh, an accessory dwelling unit or a junior accessory dwelling unit as we addressed at our last meeting. Well, we, we take the logic as the state directs us. Uh, the ADU doesn't really add a density to the property in a single family resident zones, although realistically, um, but it's, it's, a use that's allowed by right in most residential zones. In fact, you could just get the permit through a building permit. And so the people putting the beehives, it's their decision to do so. So we felt as though like other accessory uses, um, people can make that decision on their own. So I think what I'm hearing you say is, since ADUs and JADUs are now by right on the basis of state law and uh, uh, zoning ordinance changes we adopted at our last meeting, we just can't consider uh, backyard beekeeping relative to ADUs. I mean, if it's a single family zone, they can put a beehive in the yard anyway. Well, it's the property rights decision and the people living in the ADU, um, you know, there's a relationship there that uh, I can't speak to, but yes, that we would consider it an accessory use. And there's no setback from the principal dwelling either, and it could be the people in the ADU who are interested in doing bee hobbyists. So we didn't want to limit people's rights to or uh, access to this if they decided to do so based on these BMPs. Okay, but what I'm hearing is there's no mechanism based on the county ordinance to have any kind of regulation in those unique situations. Not currently in what's proposed. Um, I suppose we could put that in there if you were interested in doing so. Well, I think I would or ask uh, County Council Barnes just how big a can of peas would, or a can of worms would we be opening if we tried to address that? I'm sorry, what's the specific issue? A setback from an accessory dwelling unit on our property and, you know, the inherent access, the logic of that being an allowed use and really no, not, not much different than the single family dwelling itself. Right, yeah, I, I wouldn't recommend um, having a, a, a special rule for, for ADUs based on the, the state laws there. Okay, thank you. That's all I have. Any other commissioners have questions? Seeing none, I have a couple. Section 8107-2.6.1, 
the definition of a commercial beekeeper is five hives or more. And I realize it's been 14 years since I was the Ag Commissioner, but uh, can Corinne or Greta tell me what the state law or the state definition of a commercial beekeeper is? Hi, yeah, I'll speak to that again, it's Greta. Um, so I was reading the state laws yesterday and I didn't necessarily, I didn't come across that. Um, but I will say we, we consider whether they are um, having financial gain from the commercial, whether they're selling, have financial gain versus a backyard beekeepers for their own use. So, so there's no minimum number. Of hives. Not that I read, I read yesterday, but I will definitely dig into that deeper. Okay, because I have no problem with four being the max in the residential zone, but five is not a commercial beekeeper, and that number should be changed at least fifty to a hundred if somebody's actually going to make money off of it. But that's neither here nor there, I guess. My other point that I want to make. The six to seven foot barrier in front of a beehive, I'll have to freely admit, I really got a chuckle out of that when I read that because bees are going to go wherever they're going to go. And a six or seven foot barrier, they'll just go around it or whatever. The, the barrier to me is, is not necessary because uh, if, if there's pollen or whatever on the other side of the yard or the other side of the fence, they're just gonna go around it and go. Bees are gonna go where they can find the food and a barrier like that isn't gonna stop them. And I think that needs to be considered. Um, thank you, Chair McPhail. In response to the flyaway barrier, uh, staff researched like at least 14 different jurisdictions in California that have these type of ordinances, and I'll say about 90% of them have flyaway barrier um, conditions. And based on you know doing our research and the best practices, we've determined that we would like to recommend that a flyaway barrier be proposed, especially because it's in the residential zones, which are, you know, close. I, I, I hear what you're saying as far as bees go wherever they want to go, but this yeah. has been something that we've yeah, researched I, with other jurisdictions. Yeah, I read that all the different other areas that have that in their city or county ordinance, but I guess my question is, did you do any research on whether or not they really work? Chairman McVail, this is Winston Wright again, thank you. Um, the barrier is to, intended to uh, alter the behavior of the flight of the bee for the vast majority of the bees that need to scavenge. And so incidental bees, of course, will wander off and forage in areas that wherever they need to, of course. And the barrier is intended, and maybe Greta can speak to that at the Ag Commissioner's Office, but it's a behavioral issue where you can get the bee flying at a higher grade or at least the mass, vast majority because there's thousands of bees in each hive. So the foraging bee obviously will go where it needs to go, but this is trying to deal with the larger population and trend of flight. I understand that, but my question still is, did you do any research on whether or not they work? I, I know sure. how a bee acts. I mean, I, my whole professional career was enforcing pesticide laws and bee laws and everything else. So uh, I know how bees act. And if there's something over here, and this is a beehive right here, and that's the barrier, they're gonna do this because that's where the food source is, a barrier six, seven foot high, say maybe six, seven foot wide. I, I, I you know, if they work, that would be great, but I, I can't see how they would work. Chair McPhail, staff did not follow up with the other 
jurisdictions to find out if the barrier worked or not. Thank works you. or not. That's the answer I wanted. <laughs> Any other com commissioners have questions? Seeing none. Hi, uh, Commissioner, oh. uh, Chair McPhail. I did have just a couple uh, questions. Um, one is regarding the education component that would be um, the education or course to be approved by ACO um, that would be required of backyard beekeepers. I just wanted clarification about if, if, um, if a zoning clearance is no longer required, at what point or how would the county verify that the education course um, has been completed? I mean, is there a link, a connection between the registration, who's issuing the registration and who's checking that the course has been completed? And then my second question is regarding um, the fact that APAC, uh, RCMA, or RMA, excuse me, code compliance would be responsible for um, responding to backyard beekeeping complaints. Um, not, uh, so I, I guess I'm just curious if, if staff could elaborate on how that decision came to be and whether um, code compliance has the uh, expertise to be able to respond um, effectively to uh, to complaints, um, why why the commissioner office isn't isn't doing that uh, directly? Thank you. Hi, this is Greta again. I think I can talk to both of those points. Um, so the course we're in the progress of creating it and putting it together. We're working with Dr. Alicon with UC. Um, Channel Islands, and he's working with UC Davis to help us put a, together a program. Uh, San Diego County has an online course right now that we all took internally, and it's about a half hour, and it goes through best management practices. And it's like a slideshow that has video associated with it. And at the end of that course is a 10-question quiz. And then when you're done, you get a little certificate. So our plan is if this passes that we would create something very similar, but more associated to uh, Ventura County. And then um, Dr. Alicon is currently working on putting together with UC Extension in the county and um, the Ventura College, they're creating an apiary program. And so they're gonna have different levels of certification with that program. So you can take courses as it's gonna be a public um, any, anyone, anyone interested in them beekeeping can go and learn more hands-on. And then we'll accept those certificates in lieu of our course. And our way of regulating that, and again, with this whole ordinance, is to have all these beekeepers register so we do know who's in the county. And then when they come to register, it's on the 1st of January every year, we would require them their first registration to take that course before we issue them their registration. Does that answer your question about that? Yeah, that does help. Thank you. And are they required to take annual courses, um, like to keep, or is it just one, a one-time course? We were gonna, yeah, we were just gonna do the first time they register. Okay, thank yep. you. Yep. Um, and then to speak to your second question, we did talk with um, Franca, and um, we will be regulating any of the inspection-based complaints. So um, if it's a disease, if it's swarming, if it's aggressive bees, um, the water, um, and then all the commercial, obviously. So the backyard beekeeper complaints, whether they call our mayor, they call us, if it has anything to do with disease or Africanized bees, we are the experts. We will be looking into that. Uh, they will be doing more of the setbacks. So those aren't our um, you know, they're not our regulations to enforce. We don't have the authority to enforce the regulations. So that will, so we, we have a um, understanding between the two of us, depending on the nature of the complaint, if our inspectors go out and they notice that, okay, the setbacks aren't what they should be, then we direct that to them. Okay. Thank you for clarifying that. Of course. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions before we move on? Seeing no hands, Franca. 
Okay, just give me one moment so I get the screen back up. The next, proposed, the next proposed amendments are to the existing fence regulations of the NCZO. The fence regulations are contained in Article 6, Section 8106-8.1. The planning division has received comments and feedback from staff, property owners, and contractors that the current fence regulations are formatted and organized in a way that is not easily understood and that some of the regulations do not accurately reflect real life scenarios. In response to these comments, staff has reformatted, reorganized, and added illustrations to make the ordinance easier to understand, um, made minor typographical, grammatical, and stylistic changes, added more allowances for the construction of seven foot tall solid fences and certain setbacks on a property, clarified when a zoning clearance is required for fencing, and clarified the location of vehicle entrance gates. The illustration here shows several different fence regulations and is proposed to be added to the ordinance to help clarify these regulations. Let's see. The current fence ordinance does not allow solid fences over three feet tall or five feet see-through in certain areas on a property. I'm sorry, let me repeat that. The ordinance does not allow solid fences over three feet tall. Um, the exception to that is if it's a five foot see-through fence in certain areas on the property. Hold on, I'm gonna have to do this, sorry. So these areas include, having technical difficulties here, here we go. Um, these areas include a required, tri required site triangle. Um, a site triangle is essentially a triangular area on a corner lot, two of the sides extending 40 feet back along the streets. A site triangle is required when there are no traffic controls on either street at an intersection. A required setback adjacent to a street, such as a front setback, and in a 10 foot by 10 foot right triangle on each side of a driveway on a side property line. Exceptions to um, those rules, a maximum seven foot tall see-through fence may be located anywhere in a lot of 20,000 square feet or greater in a front setback, on a side setback in the rear. And a maximum seven foot tall solid fence may also be located in on a corner lot. A standard corner lot is, is um, at two, when two sides of the property are at an intersection. The planning division is proposing to allow a seven foot tall solid fence in a reverse corner lot on a property. A reverse corner lot is when the rear of a corner lot abuts the side of another lot. A seven foot high um, solid fence may only be located in the street side setback if a 10 foot by 10 foot right triangle at the rear of the property adjacent to the uh, another lot is um, maintained three feet or less in that area. And a seven foot tall solid fence may be located in interior rear and side setbacks, which is already an existing um, regulation. 
Additional exceptions that planning division is pro proposing is to allow a maximum seven foot tall solid fence in a rear setback adjacent to a street when a lot is a through lot in a rear setback when a lot is bounded on three sides by a street, one of which is a rear lot line, and in a rear setback adjacent to a street when the lot is a flag lot or irregular shaped lot that has no street frontage along the front lot line. Planning staff also um, added some amendments to clarify the location of vehicle entrance gates. Vehicle entrance gates are proposed to be set back at least 20 feet from the property line so that vehicles are not waiting in the street or obstructing the sidewalks. The ordinate, proposed ordinance would also clarify um, the location of the gate when it's a, at an angle on the lot and requires that the gate swing inwards towards the property. Again, the intent of this uh, regulation is so that the vehicle is not obstructing traffic or the sidewalks. In 2019, the Ventura County Building Code was updated to um, allow fences over up to seven feet without a building permit. And they also modified some other fencing regulations. Um, the planning division um, is proposing to be consistent with the building code and we have proposed to modify when a zoning clearance is required for fencing. A zoning clearance would be required when a fence is over seven feet in height, um, when a fence um, includes electricity for lights and or to power an entry gate, and for any retaining walls that are over three feet in height or supporting a slope surcharge. Um, the current ordinance does not have regulations for retaining walls. Um, just one moment, let me. <laughs> my notes. Um, the current ordinance provides requirements for measuring a fence where there's a difference in grade on two sides of a fence, but it does not specifically address height and setbacks for structural retaining walls. Because structural retaining walls may be necessary as part of developing a property with slopes, the proposed text amendment clarifies a long-standing administrative policy that retaining walls are not subject to the fence height limits unless within a 10 foot by 10 foot right triangle on each side of a driveway, in which case the retaining wall cannot be taller than three feet. This would ensure the safety of pedestrians and vehicles when a vehicle is pulling out of a driveway. Sorry. So the proposed amendments would also clarify that fences on top of retaining walls are subject to the fence height limits. If a fence is located less than five feet from the edge of a retaining wall, then the combined height of the retaining wall and the fence cannot exceed 10 feet tall. So that concludes the fence regulations. If you'd like me to pause here, I can, okay. Do any commissioners have any questions? I have a question regarding that last slide. Go ahead, Commissioner Dukas. Could we go back to the last slide? Um, I find that confusing because um, the, the retaining wall is that, um, that angled line, right? And uh, the total can't be more than 10 feet. Um, it just looks like um, uh, the the drawing is out of scale. Am, am I just reading it wrong? Would it be clearer to have um, the the um, diagram be more drawn to scale? Commissioner Adukas, yes, um, I agree. It is not drawn to scale, and um, we could have our graphics um, team 
prepare a illustration that's drawn to scale and included in the ordinance. I think that would be helpful because um, just looking at that as a as a lay person, I would find that very confusing. So if it could just be, you know, and I understand it's a schematic, it's not a plan, but um, for for it to be clearer, I think the illustration should be a little more to scale. Thank you, Chair Adukas. Um, this is noted, and we'll follow up on that. Any I have a other? question. Commissioner Boyston, go ahead. Yeah, so on the same slide, a more typical application would be that you would have a wall directly on top of a retaining wall without an offset. Um, that would be a more typical way that you would see it is, is I don't know if a second kind of diagram that would show that would be useful so that the combined height is is 10 feet. And then it, at some point, you know, if somebody's property is on the higher side and they want a six foot wall for privacy uh, from the neighbor next door, that 10 feet may, in fact, only allow them to have a three foot high wall on their side from their, their height. So um, I've run into that also. I guess at that point, you would be going back for a planning permit. Vice Chair Boydston, this is that, Vice Chair Boydston, this is um, uh, Winston, uh, right, from the planning division here. Um, this situation does occur in the residential areas and it, ha it you, from the perspective of the property who's below, it's a quite ominous um, wall to have something taller than 10 feet. And so you, there are situations where it's appropriate to set the wall back five feet so that that sheer wall is not immediately in, encapsulating someone's backyard. And so that's the intent. And it has been, um, that has been seen where someone needs to put in a swimming pool and they need the seven foot fence regardless of the grade difference, or, ex or excuse me, the six foot fence um, for safety reasons. And, um, uh, you would probably, you would in that situation have to set your fence back uh, five and one inch or slightly over five feet. And then you could put that six foot wall up or seven foot wall now. So could there be a definite or a, a dis distinction between a solid wall and a, a see-through fence? Yeah. On top. It's, there's no provision on I I extending the, um, a clear fence taller than that. No, at the moment, no, there's no, no exception for that. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Hearing none, Franco, you can continue, please. Excuse me, planning recommends expanding the type of structures that would apply to setback exemptions under Article 6, Section 8106-5.5. The current ordinance allows heating and cooling equipment, filtering and circulation pumps to be placed a minimum of three feet from the rear and side property lines. Planning staff proposes to expand the list to generators and backup battery packs, such as Tesla power walls. The proposed amendment clarifies that this type of accessory equipment is exempt from planning permits. However, the property owner would still need to adhere to the setback requirements of the ordinance. The amendment also clarifies that a permit may be required if the equipment is associated with a previously approved and active discretionary permit. In order to reflect an exemption from the planning division permits, a new category is being added to the use matrix of sections 8105-4 and 8105-5, as well as in the use matrix of Article 19, Section 8119-1 of the Satakoy Area Plan. Section 
So that concludes the proposed ordinance amendments in whole. And planning staff has concluded or has determined that the proposed amendments are exempt from planning or from environmental review per CEQA guidelines section 15061B3, which indicates that there's no possibility that the activity in question may have a significant effect on the environment. Um, pursuant to CEQA guidelines section 15307 and 15308, when a project is when actions are taken by regulatory agencies to protect natural resources and the environment. And CEQA guidelines section 15303, um, when the project consists of construction or conversion of small structures. The board must make certain findings in order to amend the ordinance. Um, the required findings are that the proposed amendments would not be detrimental to the public health, safety, or general welfare, that the amendments represent good zoning practice, and that they're consistent with the Ventura County General Plan. Staff has made the required findings, which are included in Section C of the staff report. The planning division conducted public outreach and provided public notice of uh, this hearing as well as the APAC and uh, APAC meetings. We provided a 30-day public review of the draft ordinance. We noticed um, the proposed amendments in the Ventura County Star and also included a Spanish version in the Vida newspaper. We posted it on our bulletin board out front on the Planning Commission's website, and we emailed the notice to interested persons, which included over 100 parties in all 10 cities. Planning staff received one written public comment during the 30-day public comment review period concerning the proposed beekeeping ordinance. Um, the comments included revisions to a definition, clarifying some terminology, and the education component. Staff address these comments in the proposed ordinance and in the staff report. So the recommended actions are included in the staff report in section E. Um, I won't read them out here. And this concludes uh, my presentation. Planning staff's available for any additional questions as well as the Code Compliance Division and the Ag Commissioner's Office. Okay, thank you. Uh, is there any other questions from commissioners? I had an additional question just for clarification. Go uh, ahead, Commissioner. Is, is there, thank you. Um, is there a, a threshold of, you know, if, if a certain number of complaints are received um, and, and processed by uh, the Agricultural Commissioner's Office that would lead to a um, registration being revoked. And that's, I, I imagine that there are already protocols for that now, but are there any changes as a result of this ordinance? Can, can we get clarification on that? Greta, you're muted. You're muted. Sorry about that. Um, so currently there's not a threshold of if we get so many complaints per beekeeper that we would, um, you know, revoke registration. With the registrations, we really don't want to use that as an enforcement. We want people to get to be registered, so we don't want to discourage the registration. It's to everyone's benefit that they are registered. I will say that every complaint that we get into the office, um, we've never not had one we weren't able to work out with. We have had some um, where we're not able to get in touch with the beekeeper and we leave abatement notices and then, um, you know, they all move them overnight. So that would be our worst case scenario that if we're getting a lot of complaints about a particular beekeeper, we do have the authority to abate. However, um, you know, I, I've only seen that happen twice. So there is not a threshold. It would be an internal decision with uh, our commissioner, Ed, of how we would proceed with that. But revoking registration isn't something that we want to do. Thank you. Any other questions of staff? Commissioner Boyston. So I, I was curious about the um, um, 
allowing generators to be very close to property lines. Typically, generators have noise and, and uh, potentially smoke um, consequences, and they're, they're highly regulated in commercial properties in, in, the, in the distances between um, the generator and a residential property. And there's also a number of sound dampening requirements that typically are required. So I'm curious why generators are, are uh, in the category of not essentially being regulated. Commissioner Boydston, this is Winston from the Planning Division. Um, currently, that's the existing regulation. So we, we would cheat, treat emergency backup generators as equipment for a home. So currently, that's how it's practiced. Um, we have very few complaints about noise that I'm aware of. Maybe code enforcement can speak to that. Although, of course, it, it does occur. Though there's um, numerous sit situations where compassion is leading um, our, our um, position in that you know people need backup generation uh, in certain circumstances whether it's medical or just necessity and decisions and of course batteries are uh, replacing in many instances the need for generators so we ha currently do not um, limit the placement of generators except to make sure that they're at least three feet away from the side and rear and in most modern um, generators are compliant or all modern um, generators are registered or, or, or licensed to be clean air um, uh, designed and APCD has certain level of regulation of course over commercial and industrial and we did put a clarification that larger generators that are related to um, discretionary projects may still be subject to a permit depending you know on the situation maybe it's not a small air conditioning unit but of course a big Tesla uh, battery pack system that was to more industrial in size or even generators that are for a uh, packing plants or something like that, that that still may require a permit if it's under discretionary um, review and is commercial or industrial in nature or, or even agricultural. So was there any, any thought to maybe having it 10 feet away from a property line uh, as opposed to three? Um, there are many instances where we we know that there are noise issues with things and we put them a little bit further away, not, not to restrict them from being on the property, but having knowledge that, that they could create a sound uh, impact on neighboring properties, um, especially residential where you have, you have, could have houses next door that are three feet from the property line. Com Commissioner Boydston, I, I would, um, weigh in that I have more experience with complaints from pool pumps than I do for um, generators. Um, generators are generally used for emergency situations and only turn on during blackouts or um, and that's a, that's what the vast majority are intended for at this point um, or you know what we see the generators are for the most more more often than not are actually for wireless communication facilities and those do have their own permitting path and would continue to require a permit um, for, from the planning division. And those you know, could be very loud because they're more industrial in nature. But you know, we do get a lot of complaints with swimming pools. And if we were to tell people that you need to move your pool equipment in Oak Park 10 feet away from the side property line, I think I would be strung up. I think I was speaking of generators, not pool equipment. But sure, thank sure. You. But I'm just from my experience, the complaints come from pool pump generators, and in the my, you know, and I can have code enforcement speak to that. But I'm not really, I don't really hear a lot of complaints about generators. Does code enforcement receive complaints about generators, Doug? Uh, hi, Doug Leeper, Code Compliance Director. Yeah, we do from time to time. Uh, the the complaints we generally receive though are folks that are using them. Uh, in, in an alternative to actually being on the grid. And they're generally in more remote areas as far as, uh, you know, uh, closer line setbacks in residential areas. Um, we get very few. Um, I know there are folks out there that have a small emergency generator. So if the power goes out, they can, you know, keep the refrigerator and any oxygen equipment functioning. Uh, but the complaints I'm aware of as far as noise from from mechanical equipment, uh, again, is, it, I'll, I'll 
you know, reiterate what Winston said is the pool equipment, which is a very similar uh, uh, decibel level to a small uh, uh, residential generator uh, and pool equipment goes, you know, at any hour of the day or night, 24 seven to keep the pool clean. And so the generator uh, complaints we receive, again, are generally something where somebody, say, in a Lockwood Valley or, or um, maybe Miners Oaks out, out a little more remote yeah. uh, is using it in uh, rather than, uh, you know, hooking up to the uh, to the electrical grid. And that obviously would, uh, is a violation. And, and we deal with that. Um, generally, it comes along with unpermitted construction and other zoning violations. But as far as the, you know, small you know, emergency generators, I, I'm, I'm going to say we get less than, than five com, uh, reports or complaints of that a year. Commissioner Boydston, this is Winston again. I'm sorry to interrupt. Um, if we can add the word emergency backup generator, and um, of course, the complaints that um, uh, Mr. Leaper's encountering are generally ones that are being misused or inappropriately used, um, for like a campsite situation or for long-term use. So we can add the term emergency backup generator if, if that might help the situ your, your concerns. Yeah, I think that would help my concern. Winston, a quick question. Do we have a definition of <laughs> what, a, what constitutes an emergency? <laughs> I would assume we'd go with uh, uh, you know the general Mr. definition. Lieber, yes, yes, there is. Okay. That will help us when we have to go out and enforce it. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Any other questions of staff from commissioners? Seeing no hands raised, I will now <clears throat> open the public hearing. Do we have any speakers? The answer from staff is no. Uh, do we have any rebuttals from staff? <laughs> Smiles over there, so no. I will now close the public hearing and ask any discussion or motion. Commissioner Dukas, you're muted. Commissioner Dukas. I would, uh, I would move uh, staff's recommended actions. I'd um, include the errata exhibit. Um, I'd ask the um, planning staff to, um, to re, um, have a new illustration that's drawn more to scale regarding the retaining wall and the addition that um, uh, uh, Commis uh, Vice Chair Boydston uh, mentioned. Also, um, add a word about emergency generators, uh, temporary emergency generators. And uh, that's my motion. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Commissioner King. Uh, would the motion and the seconder consider changing section 8107-2.6.1 the definition of commercial beekeeping to the definition that the California Department of Food and Agriculture uses as definition for commercial beekeeping. And the other item is staff research barriers to see if they work. Um, bar barriers work um, in my very limited um, experience because they just direct the the bee traffic yes it's true bees fly wherever they do but um you have a concentration of population near the hive and and they do direct the the bees to fly up and over you know people's heads um and and i think it's a very common uh i think it's a very common thing um also uh the uh when you were asking the question about um, whether or not it's commercial or not commercial, I remember a question coming up, and believe me, this this relates about what is a bedroom, and um, and it's it's like whatever commercial is whatever not what the hobbyists are doing, and it's just a a 
a way of saying of delineating the the hobbyist from everybody else. I hear what you're saying. In order to be um, a successful, to have a, a a beekeeping activity that is um, viable, um, it, you would have to have hundreds and hundreds of of hives. So I hear what you're saying, but no, I don't think that's necessary to add. Commissioner King. Yeah, I would agree with uh, Commissioner Dukas. I, <clears throat> I think uh, the language is uh, clear enough. It draws a line between the hobbyist and the commercial operator. And even though that line is so low for commercial operator, I don't think it, um, I don't think it adds anything to the ordinance to jack that number up. So I agree with that. I'm not talking about a number. The definition of a commercial beekeeper in the code, I do not believe has a number. It just talks about what a commercial beekeeper is. Nora? I, I, I hear your argument and, and um, I just think that the delineation is um, what drove this in the first place were people who um, wanted, um, you know, hobbyist beekeeping activities to be legal. And um, I think that's what um, the, the use, it, the, the usefulness of the term, you know, to delineate between who's a hobbyist and, and that number, and then everybody else is, um, is commercial. Well, I'm going to, uh, as a seconder, I'm going to stick with the original motion unless uh, uh, Commissioner A. Dukas uh, wants to change it. I understand, uh, Chair McPhail, what you're saying and your vast experience in, as an agricultural commissioner, but I don't know that that bottom limit affects anything here. And just to move it along, I think I would prefer to leave the motion intact. Okay. Secretary Luce, will you call the order, please? The uh, call the roll, please. Commissioner Aidukas? Aye. Commissioner King? Aye. Commissioner Garcia? Aye. Vice Chair Boydston? Aye. Chair McPhail? Reluctantly aye. <laughs> okay. Motion on the floor and it carried. Okay, item number eight, discussion by planning director on board items and other matters. And we have a guest today. Ms. Good morning. Curtis. Good morning, Commissioner McPhail. This is Susan Curtis, Assistant Planning Director. Uh, the only update we have for your commission is to just let you know um, your next planning commission hearing will be October 6th. We have two items for your consideration that day, and they will be related to rezoning of two separate properties for the um, purpose of entering into land conservation uh, contracts. Otherwise, that's the only update we have today. Um, Director Ward is uh, on vacation this week. Thank you. Okay. Any commissioners have anything they would like to bring up? I have one, and it's just question or a whatever, but I would respectively request that all the commissioners at the next meeting be at the, here at the boardroom. It makes things a lot easier. So consider it. You don't have to, obviously, but uh, it would be nice if all the commissioners were here. With that said, meeting adjourned. Take care all. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Bye.